Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're here for the fourth and final webinar in a series celebrating the Delaware River as our 2020 River of the Year. It's a year that's gone by quickly and boy has it been a memorable one. <laughs> the title of our program today is Dam Dam Go Away, A Wild and Scenic Vision for America's Rivers. I'm Jen Adkins, Director of Clean Water Supply for American Rivers here in the Mid-Atlantic region and I'll be our moderator for today's program. After we hear from our presenters today, we'll have some time for questions, which we're going to pull from the Q&A on Zoom. So as we go through the program, please put any questions or comments you have for the presenters in the Q&A. We've got a great line of, lineup of speakers here today, so let's go ahead and get started. To kick things off with some introductory rem remarks is Tom Kiernan, American River's new president and CEO. Tom? Thank you very much, Jen, and I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, as she said, the, the fourth and last in this uh, series. And I also want to just say up front, you're, you're in for a great treat. We do have uh, some outstanding experts with American Rivers, with Stroud and our partners, so uh, very much hope you'll enjoy it. To say a word about American Rivers, we have for now close to 50 years been protecting wild rivers, restoring damaged rivers, and conserving clean water for people in nature and have um, so far protected 150,000 miles of rivers and taken down over 200 dams. I'm thrilled today to be a part of this because of the partnership with Stroud Center. It has been a great partnership, will continue no doubt to be a great partnership as we are celebrating the Delaware. It was, as Jen alluded about a year ago, that American Rivers named Delaware the 2020 River of the Year for great reason. I mean, the incredible transformation that uh, all of you, partners, Stroud, American Rivers, and others have created for the Delaware. We have turned this river from a place where industrial waste was creating dead zones that could not support life to now uh, being a thriving ecosystem with otters, with migratory fish like the shad. And it's also home now to one of the largest protected reaches of river throughout the country. So a huge success. And I will say it's also that Delaware has become a great example of how rivers are resilient. If we give them the chance, rivers can be restored. And frankly, in a society right now with, with our fair share of challenges, it's wonderful to see successes and see rivers come back to life. So today we are gonna be talking about the connection between protecting rivers and avoiding taking down dams. We can take down dams, but it's a lot more efficient and effective to just avoid unnecessary dams from the get-go. As a result of the good work that we will talk about today, the Delaware is the only completely free-flowing main stem Eastern River. Um, and it was because of the work that was done by our partners, American Rivers, about 50 years ago that stopped the Tox Island Dam from being built. American, the, the Army Corps had a proposal um, to put a dam up at Tox Island and that was shelved fortunately. And some of the land was given to the Park Service and about 40 miles of the river were designated as wild and scenic. And so we've got a great story to tell today about the role that de uh, designating rivers in general and the Delaware in particular as a wild and scenic has as a tool in protecting rivers. And I will also say at a personal level, I was a river guide for many years on the Chattooga, one of the very first wild and scenic rivers. And you can see the benefit, the long-term benefit of a wild and scenic designation down at the Chattooga uh, now 40 years or more with that designation. I'll also observe that safeguarding rivers uh, with the wild and scenic designation provides a whole series of benefits, clearly clean water, uh, recreational opportunities, wildlife habitat, protection of sacred sites. Um, so the, the benefits are extraordinary. And I believe um, the president's recent announcement of getting 30% of the lands and waters protected, his announcement just recently on climate change, um, all of this can fit together with an effort to extend and expand the use of wild and scenic designations. So I believe we've got a great opportunity and Delaware is a wonderful showcase and it's why we are celebrating it 
as River of the Year. So with that as a backdrop, uh, let me pause and throw it back to Jen to introduce uh, David Morick, our next speaker. But Jen, back to you. Oh, Jen, I think you're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Tom. And I just was saying, I'm really excited to be working with you at American Rivers. So um, with that, we'll dive right into our presentations. And just a reminder to the audience to please remember to use the Q&A for your questions and comments. So to start us off with a policy perspective and the story of wild and scenic river designation and its impacts is David Morick, the Senior Director of Wild and Scenic Rivers and Public Lands Policy at American Rivers. David? Hi, Jen. Um, I'm ex excited to be with you all and um, I'm just gonna share my screen and dive right into my presentation. So as Jen uh, mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Wild and Scenic Rivers and Public Lands uh, for American Rivers. Uh, I actually grew up a uh, stone's throw from the Chattahoochee River in Atlanta, fly fishing with my older brother. But now I live out in, in, in Portland, Oregon, but I've, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work for American Rivers. I have since 1999. Hi, David. David, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're, you're sharing the presenter view. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank That's you. No problem. Let me exit out of here. Try again here. Just play from start. How's that? And I think you want to share the screen again. Hang on one second, folks. Apologies. How's that? Great. Super. So again, my name is David Morick. Great to be with you. And I'm going to cover a, a just a um, three, three main topics that I, I think pick up on this idea of the continuum of river conservation. You know, we, we think of um, uh, protecting rivers and their importance um, and, and wild and scenic is the key tool to um, achieving that objective. But on that same continuum, we have uh, preserving or, or restoring rivers uh, through dam removal. And it, it, it's the objective is the same, is to keep rivers free flowing or to make them free. So before I dive into the specifics around wild and scenic in the Delaware, I'd like to just give you a little background where I live in, in Oregon. This is the Sandy River, which is also designated wild and scenic, much like the Delaware. It's also where I get my drinking water. It's where I fish for food, for salmon. Uh, it's where I hike with my family. So it provides a lot of the same benefits that um, that the Delaware does for the millions of people who rely on it. And, you know, as we think about climate change and the climate crisis, um, you know, freshwater ecosystems are the best reflection, unfortunately, sometimes of the impacts of climate change, uh, floods, droughts. And by protecting and restoring rivers, we can help mitigate those impacts dramatically. Um, both for people and for ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems are the most threatened on the planet. Uh, biodiversity and species decline on, on rivers is twice that what it is in oceans and on, in, in terrestrial areas. But rivers also provide a myriad of ecosystem service benefits for communities. And by preserving them and restoring them, we can really uh, create some buffers and some resilience to climate change. And interestingly, you know, back in 1968, in the in the the way that the the, the framers of the Wild and Saint Rivers Act structured the act, they actually built in this idea of the need to balance our um, what what we had done for decades, uh, which is to to harness our rivers, to to look at our rivers a lot differently than than we do now. And I, I actually just put this quote up here because I think it it illustrates a really uh, exciting. 
an interesting point that we actually, it's a national policy that we would strike this balance. Um, unfortunately, um, we, we still have a long way to go uh, to strike that balance because only a less than a percent, one percent of our rivers in the country are, are protected under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. But the framers also looked at, and I'll get into this a little bit later, looked at this idea of protecting the values that rivers provide. So American Rivers was founded just five short years after the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was passed, in large part to pick up the mantle of the original eight rivers that were designated and use this new innovative tool to protect more rivers around the country. We've been involved in, in quite a few of, uh, if not most of the Wild and Scenic River designations since. And today the, the Wild and Scenic River system totals over 13,000 miles nationwide. And we're excited to be a part of uh, um, a relatively new um, three-year-old Wild and Scenic Rivers coalition. Uh, that's a nationwide coalition of groups that's pushing for an expansion of the system um, to double that by 2030. And, um, you know, uh, the good news is that there are currently bills pending in Congress, which is the primary vehicle for rivers to get designated, totaling over 6,000 miles of rivers that would protect one over 1 million acres of riverside lands. So just a, a quick primer um, on what Wild and Scenic does. Most of you I'm sure are familiar, but it prevents new dams and water resource projects it, it, it really focuses on protecting and enhancing, and enhancing is important. I'll come back to that as it relates to dam rule, the river's outstandingly remarkable values. Uh, it really fosters collaborative management, and that, that's especially true in the Delaware Basin. Um, we found that it really, it really puts a thumb on the scale and prioritizes restoration funding, including for dam removal. And, and it really provides also a, um, a lot of technical assistance through uh, you know, the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, other federal agencies in, in a way that really can, can equip local communities with um, tools to better protect and enhance or restore their rivers. So the upper, this is a photo of the upper Delaware. You know, I, I, you know the, starting in the Cascales and, and where I've spent more time in the Delaware Basin down near, near Cape May, it's just an incredible watershed. Tom touched on a number of its values and um, from you know, ec sustainable economic recreational values uh, to um, you know, providing drinking water for over 17 million people. It's really uh, the, ex precisely the type of river that I think the, the, the folks who've, who wrote the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act envisioned that um, we could preserve the values, the aesthetic beauty um, and the economic benefits that, that the river provides. Now, the, the Delaware is also very unique in that um, it has probably, I think, the highest concentration of, of main stem wild and scenic sections, especially in the east for such a large river. Um, and this is a map of those sections. These uh, segments were, were designated first, uh, the upper and the middle in, um, in 1978. And, um, and then a number of the key tributaries, the Muscanet Kong, uh, the Maurice, White Clay Creek, uh, were, were designated um, subsequently. And I will touch on White Clay Creek, uh, just given its uniqueness in that in 2000, much of the water, the entire watershed was designated as wild and scenic, um, only to be followed up in, in 2014 with another act of Congress that was signed into law that designated another nine miles of White Clay Creek, actually, and, and creating for the first time in, in history, an entire watershed that's, that's designated. And that is inside the east or west of the Mississippi, that is an incredibly unique model for watershed conservation and management. So as I had mentioned uh, earlier, there's this standard under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act to protect and enhance. It's not just to sort of preserve in the current condition, but it, it aims higher so that we can actually aim to, to designate, to, excuse me, to restore the function of wild, current wild and scenic rivers. That includes dam removals. And um, there are just in Pennsylvania alone, there are over 1,800 dams, um, and and American Rivers has worked with its partners and helped 
uh, foster removal of many of those dams. And there's an incredible opportunity to foster additional uh, or dam removals in the years to come. Now, I focus on White Clay Creek um, because uh, it's one of the places where American Rivers and our partners, uh, White Clay Creek Watershed Association and the White Clay uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Program and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and others partnered to help remove Burns Mill Dam, um, which is hopefully the first of, of many that come down in White Clay Creek. And it's a fantastic example of the resilience of combining these tools of building local watershed um, capacity and stewardship along with protection to help foster additional restoration. And um, as, is, as, is, as we've seen in dam removals elsewhere on wild and scenic rivers in places like Arizona, in Washington state, we really see the resilience of uh, rivers when they are reborn. Um, this, this dam was built a year after um, the writing of the Declaration of Independence. And, and we're, you know, we saw pretty much immediately, not just American shad, hickory shad, lamprey, other species just uh, rebound and recolonize uh, White Clay Creek. Now, in, uh, in closing, I just wanna, um, I wanna touch on uh, a, a, a fantastic resource if folks are looking for more history on wild and scenic rivers or, or the Delaware and the experience in wild and scenic. And that would be um, Tim Palmer, a former board member of American Rivers, and just uh, um, an incredible resource. If you haven't uh, taken a look at his latest book that came out a couple of years ago on wild and scenic rivers, I encourage you to do so. And with that, I will turn it back over to Jen. Thank you. Thanks, David. So um, now to share more of a science perspective on the ecological impacts of dams in the Delaware River Basin and how nature responds to their removal is Dr. Melinda Daniels, who is Associate Science Research Scientist at the Stroudwater Research Center. Melinda? Thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, as she mentioned, I'm one of the lead scientists at the Stroudwater Research Center, and my expertise is actually, um, as a river scientist, from a sort of very holistic perspective. So not just the biology, but also the hydrology and the movement of water um, and sediment as well. So what I'm going to focus on today is to try to give you a, a broad, you know, 10-minute overview of the ecological impact that dams have on systems and then how those systems respond when a dam comes out. So to get started, I'd like to uh, review sort of a basic river science concept uh, called the river continuum concept. And this really focuses on the fact that stream systems are organized spatially. Um, they're very longitudinal systems, uh, Rivers are branching networks, very similar to the architecture of a tree. And the, the, the abiotic non-living characteristics or the habitat characteristics, the hydrologic regime vary substantially from the very tips of those branches in the headwaters and smallest streams. And then they, they transition longitudinally as you move down through the network system and into bigger and bigger receiving waters. And along with those abiotic characteristics that shift, so does the biota. So there's really dramatic differences in community composition or the species that you would find in river systems, um, depending on if you were fishing um, or exploring a very small headwater stream uh, versus uh, something in the middle of a, of a large network like the Delaware Basin versus the really large sort of end members within those kinds of, net, of uh, stream networks. So as you shift from very small headwater streams downstream into larger and larger systems, the species composition varies as different species have adapted and evolved to thrive in different types of river environments. And that, that applies to the fish, which is the most recognizable um, charismatic megafauna that most people are familiar with, but it's really starkly um, expressed in some of the smaller animals that live in streams like the macroinvertebrate insect community. And those shifts are fairly predictable and, and repeat themselves in river networks all over the world. 
And so when we put um, a dam on a river, that essentially disrupts this continuum in a pretty stark way, both in terms of the hydrologic environment, the sediment environment, and definitely in terms of the biology, in terms of which species are present, which species can thrive. And if you look at this diagram I have here, um, and if you imagine us moving in a, in a boat um, or taking a hike down through a stream network from small to large, if you throw a dam up in, uh, for example, a headwater stream, something like a third or fourth order stream, uh, for those of you that are familiar with that, um, which is the type of size stream that often receives dams for things like old colonial mills. Um, and those are many of the dams that were mentioned that are still present in Pennsylvania are these smaller dam structures on small, small-ish streams. You're essentially turning that flowing small stream environment into something that looks more like a lake. And that is completely altering the physical environment and as a result, completely alters the biological community that thrives in that environment. And so we're, we're sort of mixing up this continuum, putting a big barrier in, the, in that longitudinal continuum that not only alters the ecosystem where it's at, but can act as a tremendous barrier preventing organisms from moving up and down through that very spatially longitudinally organized ecosystem. So if we were to look at um, the contrasts in the ecosystem quality or ecosystem conditions, for example, in a lake upstream of a dam, the reservoir area of a, of a dam on a river, compared to a free flowing stretch of river over here on the right, you can see there's some pretty dramatic differences in those conditions. Some of the most important ones are um, in a dammed uh, reservoir area, you have a lot more exposure to the sun and the water can heat dramatically in contrast with the free flowing reach. And so you get big temperature differences and many river species are highly sensitive to temperature. You also get a lot of trapped fine sediments um, that can accumulate and produce sort of unique conditions in the substrate that result in oxygen levels dropping. Um, you have certainly slower moving water and um, fish in particular are, their body shapes are adapted to water speed essentially. And so you can really shift to a lake community of fishes uh, upstream of a dam like this that, that has very little resemblance to a stream community of fishes that used to be there. The net result though is that you have much lower biodiversity in these um, reservoir impoundment areas. Um, compared to the free flowing systems that are not dammed. And so this is, uh, and, and finally, I do wanna emphasize this barrier element. Uh, it, it can't be any starker than this. It's very difficult for organisms to move past a dam, certainly in the upstream direction and also in the downstream direction, depending on the size and type of dam. So what happens when we take these out? Well. The ecological impact of dam removal is usually seen as very positive, obviously, because you're removing barriers, you're reconnecting the system, you're eliminating that lake habitat condition and restoring a free flowing reach. But there's always, there's usually a lot of concern uh, associated with the sediment that potentially is stored upstream in those impoundment areas and what that might do to the system downstream. And that can be a concern if the dam is of a the type that stores a substantial amount of sediment and certainly is a concern if there's any contaminants in the sediment. Um, but for the most part, many of the dam removal projects in Eastern basins like the Delaware are relatively small dams like the, the ones you see pictured here. And by small, I mean, we have um, a, very, a re relatively limited storage area, limited impoundment area and also limited potential for sediment accumulation and long-term storage. So when you take a dam out like this, you're usually dealing with a relatively small wedge of sediment as opposed to something that's chock or block full of sediment. And when that dam comes out, um, the river is able to quickly mobilize the sediment that is stored in the downstream direction. And oftentimes within a day, any residual sediment is excavated uh, by the flowing water and uh, mobilized downstream and distributed in the downstream channel area without causing any dramatic, you know, smothering of habitat or, or other negative ecological impacts. Now, 
there are some dams that do have a substantial amount of sediment stored and those are treated differently and, and oftentimes uh, the sediment does have to be removed before the dam is removed to mitigate those environmental um, negative ecological impacts. But um, if it is a, a manageable amount of sediment that's determined that the river can mobilize on its own, the, the progression of how that happens is represented in, in this slide and the next slide. And so we have here our starting point of a dam with an impoundment shown by the water. You take the dam away and it begins to dewater and form uh, a reform, a single thread channel in that particular system. And then over time, um, if there's a substantial sediment wedge, it will re-excavate a single thread channel that grows and continues to develop as the, the river flow mobilizes more sediment out of that former impoundment area um, until it reestablishes essentially a single thread channel environment. And then vegetation typically stabilizes um, the new banks if that's a part of the response to develop new banks and you go from there. Now, this is a very conceptual walkthrough and every dam is different and every dam has a different amount of sediment stored. But I wanted to just show that the classical conceptual ecological response to forming that new channel and then to show you an example of one relatively small dam on a headwater stream. So I believe this was a third order stream in Massachusetts uh, where they have done an extensive amount of dam removal as well and have, have done a good job of monitoring and, and taking photo sequences like this one that I'm showing you. So here we have the impoundment area before the dam removal. The dam's off screen on the, on the forward end here, sort of where we're stood. And then immediately following, um, about a year later, you can see that single thread channel has reestablished through the impoundment area and the accumulated sediments that were stored. And then um, by the end of that year after, so about one year from removal, you have vegetation colonizing that sediment and stabilizing it. And, and that sort of slows the progression rate of that sediment mobilization and, and allows it to happen over an ecologically um, sustainable and, and uh, non-impactful timeline so that there isn't a huge flush of sediment all at once. It gradually works its way out over time. But Perhaps the most significant ecological impact of dam removal just has to do with taking away the barrier. So when you have a, a stream network represented by the, the black line and these gray circles represent sort of, sort of habitat units that would be usable for a particular species. So say we're talking about um, something like American Shad. When you have a dam that is blocking a tributary, um, all of that habitat is essentially eliminated from access to that particular fish species. And if there happen to be members of a species trapped in that impounded um, or cut off reach, you know, they become isolated. So population isolation is usually never a good thing in terms of conservation of species. You want them to be able to interact, have a large interacting population, and that, that increases the sustainability of the species over time. So when you take a dam out, you're reconnecting all of that truncated habitat and increasing the viability of a particular species that, that might utilize that space. And the potential implications in the Delaware for this are quite extraordinary. I wanna highlight the Delaware is, a, is a, a somewhat unique situation for a large river in that there are no large dams on the main stem of the system, which is a tremendous opportunity because you have sustaining populations of migratory species like American shad that have hung on in unobstructed sections of the watershed. And as you reopen through dam removal, additional habitat, these kinds of populations can really take off and return, truly have the potential of return to pre-damming population levels, which were quite impressive and quite, um, quite attainable, I believe. So, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'll send it back to Jen um, to, to queue up the next person. Great, thanks Melinda. Um, so now for a local perspective from a wild and scenic river here in the Delaware River watershed, we're gonna hear from Alan Hunt, who is the Director of Policy and Grants at the Must Connect On Watershed Association. And he'll share the story of the wild, wild and scenic program there. Alan? <laughs> 
Thank you. I am getting the presentation set up here. Uh, there we go. There you go. Can you see that okay? All right, excellent. Uh, I'm Alan Hunt. I'm the Director of Policy and Grants at the Musconetcom Watershed Association. Uh, where we sit in the Delaware River watershed is that we're in the largest tributary of the Delaware River in New Jersey, and it's in the northwest part of uh, New Jersey. So I was asked to talk a little bit about how this all happens in practice and trying to connect the dots here with what David was talking about, the having the capacity to take down and remove the dams, and what Melinda was talking about, the science and the actual uh, proof in the pudding of the ecological restoration. So to do that, I need to tell you a little bit of a story. So while you'll see things on the slide as I go through, I may not always be referring to them at that exact time. Um, one of the things that we found out recently in one of our projects was that the formation of the watershed was really one of the key things that inspired conservation on the ground. And we found this out because we were doing a project looking at non-point source pollution reduction. So removing uh, pollution from agriculture, from uh, residences, from stormwater basins. And uh, we were doing a 10-year water quality assessment. We thought, well, we should interview some of the stakeholders, some of the people on the ground who were involved in those projects. And what we found out from them was that just the formation of the Watershed Association was a key event for them and it inspired them to take on their own conservation actions without even working with the Watershed Association and sometimes with the Watershed Association. So that brought us into a, a journal article that I'm gonna share at the end about how our capacity developed over time to take on water quality restoration projects, both for dam removals and for other types of water quality pollution. So our story and our formation story really is the genesis of taking a restoration approach in our water basin. Uh, we formed from a group of local residents who were concerned about changing water quality in the watershed, especially as development had increased in the 1980s and 1990s, and they organized a river cleanup. And one of the first things that they also decided they wanted to do was to become a wild and scenic river. Uh, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic River just got started on this process, and uh, folks on the Musconetcon were thinking, hey, this could be a good idea for us. And the organization formed out of these concerns initially. So why wild and scenic? So what you see here is a shot of the Musconetcon watershed. So the first valley you see in front is very typical for us. And in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you can actually see the Delaware water gap. We're pretty close, but it takes you a little while to get there because you have to go through all those mountains. So why do we think wild and scenic was a good idea to get started on? Well, it was a part because they had this idea of a partnership wild and scenic river program. Most of the land in the east, and you heard David talk about the east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi, Mississippi, the land in the east is mostly private land. So how do you protect these wild and scenic rivers on private land? Well, the Park Service had come up with an idea to do that. You can designate the river, form a partnership with a local group like ours, and then involve the municipalities and the communities to implement a river management plan. And that's what's done in the White Clay Creek and the Lower Delaware and the Morris River. Uh, but it didn't start that way. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, you, you heard uh, American Rivers CEO talk about uh, the Tox Island project. So the Upper Delaware was gonna be dammed. The land was condemned for that project. And they decided not to build the dam, but to make it the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. So the private land that was taken was not returned. Well, Congress had gotten about to wanting to designate another Wild and Scenic River section further upstream, the Upper Delaware Wild and Scenic, and David shared a picture of that. Folks protested, and they didn't want the federal government to come in and take their land. So the Park Service came up with this idea. We'll designate the river, only take a small amount of land, like for a visitor center and some lands that they could acquire, but form a river management council or local municipalities to implement the river. Uh, now, it still didn't sit so great with folks, and then that's when the Park Service innovated and came up with this partnership idea. And since then, there's now uh, 17 of these partnership rivers in the U.S. And what we found in looking back on this was that that time spent from 91 to 2004 in our river of working with the Park Service to figure out if the river was eligible for designation, what resources would be protected, who would be involved in the management, that was when the capacity formed, the relationships with landowners, state agencies, municipalities, uh, funders, 
to figure out what to do. And it took a long time, but through that, the organization was then able to have the relationships put in place to manage the river, uh, following the river management plan once it got designated. And to help with that process, the National Park Service provided uh, a cooperative agreement. So funding came with it for the local group to implement the river management plan. So this is when things really took off for us. And down in the lower right hand picture, you can see the metal roof. That's our river resource center. We restored an abandoned mill building. There's a mill complex here in our village of Asbury, a historic district. The bigger mill structure there, we're uh, still in the process of renovating. And then across the river is a graphite mill and there's a dam between us. This is a very typical setup in our uh, part of the world uh, for river towns. And once we had that funding, once we had our office, things really moved fast and they moved fast in two directions. One was non-point source pollution reduction, working with those farmers, working with groups like American Rivers and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Agriculture, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and then also working on dam removals. Sometimes the same partners, just in a different projects. So our conservation work really took off on these two tracks. A little bit of this came right out of our, the Wild Scenic River designation. All those partnerships we formed, we started working with those same people saying, okay, how could we reduce pollution? How could we work with farmers? And the project I mentioned at the beginning, looking at non-point source pollution reduction, uh, got kicked off through this. And we had done work uh, to identify uh, where bacteria problems were coming from in the river, whether it was agriculture, whether it was wildlife, whether it was from like leaky septic systems. We don't have a lot of sewers where we are. And uh, we did some baseline study there. And then that, that got us some uh, planning money. We put together a plan and then we were able to get uh, funding from private and public sector uh, places to uh, work with the farmers. And then in 2018, we went back and we said, well, what happened? Uh, how do we do? And we found out that we did reduce bacteria on one of the tributaries, one that we focused on. And this is something that almost never happens. We actually met our goal for reducing uh, this pollution load, but we weren't able to do it in the rest of the watershed in part because we didn't have enough capacity, enough staff, enough time to have relationships to go out with all the farmers and all the tributaries and do this. And so the bacteria actually increase in some other sections. Meanwhile, while we're doing all that, we're also taking down dams. And we have a number of these run of the river dams of, that came from these early industrial revolution mills and they're all abandoned on our watershed. Uh, none were for flood control, none were for electric power. These were all hydropower dams providing mechanical force for the grinding of uh, grain or plaster or whatever material was needed. So we were able to take out uh, two dams in the upper watershed, uh, mostly related to like recreational needs and then we figured out, well, while we worked on the lower watershed, that's where the money is to work on these projects. And that's where we're gonna get the best ecological uplift, removing those lower sections close to the Delaware River. And so we started working on the Regalsville Dam, which was part of a paper mill complex along the Delaware River, uh, the Finesville Dam, and then the Hughesville Dam in 2016. That's the most recent one we took out. That opened up about six miles of the Musconecon River to the Delaware. Uh, to the next impoundment called the Warren Mill Dam. And then the following year in 2017, the shad came back. Right away, the ecological impact happened on the next uh, breeding season for that iconic fish. And this is what it looks like. On one side of the screen, you see basically white water going through this dam site. It loses nine feet of elevation through there. And it is a, a white water kayaking experience. So we have some new recreational waters. And here's the shad on the other side. This is one of the state biologists who retired. This was like her crowning achievement in her career to see this migratory fish come back to a part of the river that had been dammed for about 300 years. And that's the next dam that we're working on behind her. So why did all of this work? It really goes back to David's point about capacity. There needs to be someone on the ground to put together all the pieces, the partners, the funding, the relationships, and figure out the regulations in your state, in your county, in your municipality. And we were able to do that once we had that funding for the National Park Service. Now they didn't pay for dam removals, they paid for the staff time to write the grants, to have the meetings, to uh, do the field visits, uh, to bring uh, elected officials out to these sites and get the public support. 
in their whole partnership approach is enshrined in the River Management Council, in our cooperative agreement and the ethos with which we pursue these projects. And it did help that once we were part of this wild scenic river system, that folks took more recognition of us and it was easier to form partnerships and a little bit easier to get funding. But where's this capacity limited? Well, we find that the capacity to do the outreach and support isn't always sufficient. So I mentioned the non-point source pollution project where we work with farmers on one tributary, but we couldn't get to all the others. Uh, we probably needed, you know, seven times more people, seven times more funding to go do that project, to have uh, the, the desired water quality outcome. It's also hard to find money for large scale projects. It's that same uh, Warren Mill Dam where the Shad uh, have stopped at. And we just brought Congressman Malinowski out. It's in his district. How can we get funding to remove this? Uh, you know, this is a big project. It's 330 feet wide. It's almost 40 feet tall. And it's a mile up in an inaccessible gorge. So how are we going to do that? And it's really hard to find matching funds when there's public funds out there and they say match it. There just isn't the support from the private sector for something that big. So if you want to learn more, if you want to kind of read more about this story, here's where you can. This article just came out uh, earlier this year. Here's our website and there's my email address. Uh, we're really glad to be part of this uh, presentation and uh, share with you an example of how uh, the Delaware River Basin's coming back. Jen? Great. Thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you, David and Melinda, as well, for your presentations. Um, we're going to do, we're only going to have time for just a little tiny bit of Q&A, but I did want to point out that I think our presenters are um, answering some of the questions in the Q&A. So if you put one there, uh, take a look out to see if, if they're typing an answer. But one that we thought was a good one to tee up, um, and let me just take a look at the Q&A, was about flood control. And it's a question from DJ Wells asking, how is flood control handled when dams, which often help mitigate the destruction of free flowing water are removed? So I'm gonna see maybe if David, do you wanna try and respond to that one? Sure, yeah, I was just, uh frantically trying to answer questions and typing to DJ. So I'm glad you, you stopped me. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I, it's a really good question. And I think, um, uh, I think in ge the general answer is that, you know, not all dams are created equally and some actually provide real uh, benefits and the public needs to make a, make a policy call, make a decision about whether or not those dams should be remain in place for things like flood control. And um, so a lot of the dams and barriers that we're talking about removing um, have either outlived their, their lifespan or the costs uh, outweigh the benefits. So I think that it's a case by case basis. Um, I think there are, there are natural infrastructure strategies to help alleviate flooding. Um, we're actually looking at a case of where a dam is being considered in Washington state and in lieu of building that dam, we're actually um, compiling the scientific information to see if there are natural infrastructure strategies that would achieve the same benefits. But in general, you know, at least for American rivers, we don't advocate for removal of all dams. We're just looking at those that are that actually are a, a, a public safety ish, a hazard or that they have significant enough environmental impacts that warrant removal. Okay, thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, I think that's about all the time we have for Q&A. Um, I just wanted to thank our presenters again, absolutely. Um, and also to see, I don't know if folks have enough time to try and answer some of the questions, but we did get some great questions uh, in the chat. So um, that wraps up the program for today. And in addition to thanking the speakers, I just want to especially thank Stroud Water Research Center for co-hosting this webinar with us and really for this whole series, which has been great. Um, I also, of course, wanna thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the presentations and will help us to keep celebrating the Delaware River. Just because our river of the year, year is at an end, it does not mean that we need to stop celebrating this wonderful river. So um, with that, we'll wrap things up and I'll just say to everyone, take care, be well, and enjoy your local rivers. Thank you.